the name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, I'm bold to bring you this word today. Amen. So Peter has made his way back from a mission among the despised and distrusted Gentiles. He doesn't get a good reception. But he makes his case amongst the faithful in Jerusalem by describing a vision, a strange kind of vision for those of us raised on abundance and raised without the kind of ritual food limitations that were so much a part of Jewish life. In this vision, it seems that Peter has seen beyond his the limits of his his cultural fears. And he has trusted God for what comes next. And what comes next is that the Holy Spirit is given to those same despised, distrusted Gentiles who who now must be called siblings in faith, children of the Most High, beloved friends of Jesus, It's quite a moment. Now, as a 21st century human and well acquainted with debates along religious lines in church courts, I confess myself a little bit doubtful whenever I read this passage in Acts. I'm doubtful that the change of heart amongst those who accosted Peter was so swift and complete. Sure, this this is a miracle, this changing of hearts and minds, both among the Gentiles and amongst those who meet Peter in Jerusalem. This is a miracle, first and foremost. As a 21st century person of faith, a person acquainted with the workings of the church, My question is, when has there ever been a religious gathering that when trying to decide on its membership did not endure some continual grumbling and mumbling and squabbling and complaining? No matter how convincing the argument or vivid the vision of divine permission might be, it's never that simple. Right? So it must have been a miracle. And maybe, maybe just this once, love ruled the day. Maybe. It's not impossible, right? So close to the other foundational miracle of the faith, the resurrection, love must be the answer for this swift and glorious acceptance of what Peter describes. Maybe the lessons of Easter still cling tightly to this band of Jesus folk. The memories of those astonished apostles telling anyone who would listen that Jesus is risen. Or that story about the breakfast on the beach or or the encounter at Emmaus. The stories of Jesus are still more than just a nine days wonder by the time the Acts of the Apostles is put in writing. And it was written to keep those memories fresh, to explain the enthusiasms of the young and emerging church. This is how it moves from an expression of Jewish longing for a divine kingdom to something completely different. So, I have to conclude from the 21st century that it must have been love. It must have been love. But as fascinating as Peter's vision might have been, and as formative as his work amongst the Gentiles was, it's still the gospel that gets me this morning. 
And yes, we're back in the pre-Easter portion of John's gospel. And I think that's what intrigues me the most. See, we don't always get to hear this bit of John 13. Uh, It does come up occasionally in Holy Week. But when it does come up, we are too soon distracted by what happens next. Because the passage opens with the words, And when he had left, the he, in this case, is Judas, who has gone off into the darkness to do what Judas does. And darker things soon follow. Yet even on the brink of this, on the very edge of betrayal, Jesus speaks of glory. And he commands his confused disciples to live in love with one another. The best way to get the message to the world, he says, even though they don't know yet that that's the goal, the best way to get the message to the world is by loving one another. Doesn't that seem strange? A strange thing to say on the edge of such a disaster. Because by now the stage is set. Jesus knows how this will play out. I go where you cannot follow, he says yet again. And he will go to the high priest, then to Pilate, then into the hands of the Roman soldiers, ultimately to a grisly death and a new rock tomb. And they won't follow except for the women. No, the disciples will run and hide and worry and wonder. And knowing this about his friends, Jesus commands them to love one another. In spite of everything and because of everything, just love one another. And I think what's interesting for me about this particular passage and the way John describes it is that Jesus doesn't say, love one another because soon it's going to be harder to love one another. It's going to be harder to get along when the teacher is not present. It's going to be harder to live in love and hope when the sky is pitch black and the authorities are scrambling to maintain a hold on their power. Jesus didn't say any of that. Jesus didn't say, well, fellows, this looks like our last gathering. Remember the good times. Nor did he say, And be cheerful through the bad times, you know, because they're coming. No, he said, love one another. That is the legacy that we must tend to. To love one another, even when we disagree. And God knows we do that often enough. To love one another when it's easier to criticize. To love through circumstances that make it difficult to speak or visit or offer even the simplest kind of sympathy. To love one another when the world would have us choose sides. That is key to our witness as followers of Jesus. And this is a Jesus lesson that the church needs to take seriously if nobody else does. Now more than ever. Now that the world is more fractious. Now that tempers are easily frayed and everyone seems desperate and our anxiety about the future is vivid and sharp. Now it is the love that identifies us as disciples of Jesus that is crucial to show the world. By this, Jesus says, everyone will know. Everyone. Which includes us. Everyone 
which includes that present day and this present day. For the world now as then longs for hope. And Jesus offers hope. Not just the hope of the resurrection, though that isn't nothing. But Jesus' love models a manner of living and engaging with humanity that seeks the best in each person. Think about all of those through the gospel whom Jesus met and healed and blessed along his way. Each of those, in their own way, was returned to themselves. No longer are they chained in the graveyard. They are free. No longer are they outcast by society. They are included. No longer are they that woman or that fellow. They are part of the family of God. Everyone that Jesus meets is seen not, by, not as an outcast or a menace, but as a child of God. The love that Jesus encourages us to offer one another is the same love that he had for everyone he met. And this is the foundation of the peaceable kingdom that we long for, that God promises. This is the hope we are commanded to offer to the world in Jesus' name. And it starts by us loving one another. It's not just a church problem. It's broader than that. But you've got to start somewhere, right? And I was reminded of that the other day when I heard a song on the radio... A song by a band that I'd been grooving to since high school. I know you find that hard to imagine, Pamela, but it happens. I groove. My wife makes the same face when I groove. Anyhow, Genesis. Who here doesn't love Genesis, right? Well, I can see a few, but that's okay. They're one of these bands that I just never get tired of listening to. And one of their songs from about the mid-80s popped up on the radio the other day, Land of Confusion. You smile if you know it. But the chorus, the chorus is what caught my ear. This is the time. This is the place. So we look to the future, but there's not much love to go around. Tell me why this is a land of confusion. There's not much love to go around. And Jesus knew what the solution was long before Phil Collins called it a problem. Love one another. You, my people, the ones I loved, love one another. Show them the way. Set an example, just like Jesus did. Now, if you're a Genesis fan, you know that that's not the end of the chorus. If the song is playing in your head right now, you're thinking, he stopped too soon. And I don't pretend to know anything about the state of Phil Collins' spiritual mind. But the last half of the chorus sounds suspiciously like something Jesus might have said. Although I give full credit to Anthony Banks, Michael Rutherford, and Philip Collins as is required by copyright law. (laughs) The second half of the chorus. This is the world we live in. And these are the hands we're given. Use them. And let's start trying to make it a place worth living in. And love is the best place to start.